Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again today. On today's show, we will be doing another hymn review. I mentioned that I would be doing that last time, so here we are. The hymn that we will be discussing is William Cooper's Exhortation to Prayer. This is a wonderful hymn I happened to come across while reading through the only hymns again, and I thought I would share it with you all. Just to give you a little brief introduction to the hymn, this hymn, as I said, is written by William Cooper. For those who might be new to the channel, channel, William Cooper is someone we have covered before in an episode. I suggest that you check that out. You'll get a biographical sketch of his life, his struggle with depression, and a taste of all the wonderful work that he did through his hymnody, his poetry, and just leaving us a wonderful example. But uh, for the little introduction in this episode, I will mention that William Cooper was an 18th century Anglican evangelical. He was situated in Olney, which was a market village, still is a market village in England, where he was writing a lot of hymns, working on a lot of poetry, and that was mostly in the context of his f uh, friendship with John Newton. John Newton being that great evangelical hymnist and abolitionist, him and Cooper would wo both be working on the abolition front, a great note there, and together they produced the only hymns, this wonderful hymn book that I introduced in a previous episode as well. So, What's this hymn, An Exhortation to Prayer? Well, to give you a bit of that context, it is found in the second book of their hymn book. As I mentioned in a previous episode on the Only Hymns where I introduced that, uh, the Only Hymns are divided into three books, the first book being on scripture, and now the second book being on occasional subjects. Here in the second book of the Only Hymns, you'll find hymns that relate to sacraments. So you'll find hymns that are perfect for uh, when your church is doing the Lord's Supper. You'll also find hymns that relate to the reading of scripture, why we should be reading uh, scripture, why we should appreciate it, how we might appreciate it. And for today, there's a section within the second book on prayer. And that, of course, is where you find Cooper's hymn, Exhortation to Prayer. So, what am I going to do for the remainder of this episode? I'm going to read you the hymn. I'm going to break it down piece by piece, not in order, but rather in terms of features that the hymn has. I'll be looking at the different things we can learn from the hymn, what it contains, where it points to scripture, and what we might glean about it for our own lives as evangelicals, as Christians, or again, as someone who might be just thinking about all this stuff and wrestling through it. So with that introduction out of the way, let me now read you the hymn. Cooper's Exhortation to Prayer. What various hindrances we meet in coming to a mercy seat. Yet who that knows the worth of prayer but wishes to be often there? Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw, gives exercise to faith and love, brings every blessing from above. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright. And Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. While Moses stood with arms spread wide, success was found on Israel's side. But when through weakness, weariness, they failed, that moment Amalek prevailed. Have you no words? Ah, think again. Words flow apace when you complain and fill your fellow creature's ear with the sad tale of all your care. Were half the breath thus vainly spent, to heaven in supplication sent, your cheerful song would oftener be, hear what the Lord has done for me. What a wonderful hymn. I really enjoy it. And I should mention before diving into it that this hymn, uh, this poem, this hymn, whatever we want to call it, is found in multiple different editions across a variety of hymn books. It is a pretty well-known hymn in that it found its way throughout church history into many different hymn books. But as is so often with many great hymns, it was changed over the years. Some of the words were changed. Some of the stanzas were just entirely changed. Some of them dropped. But here we have the original edition you can find in the works of Newton. You can find in the original only hymn book and in a few of the older hymn books used throughout church history. With that said, with a sort of second introduction, let's dive into the features of this hymn that I think are worth highlighting. So, to begin, I want to discuss how this hymn describes the blessing that prayer provides. And to do that, I want to zoom in on the second and third stanza. Let me read those out again. Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw. Pause right there. It climbs the ladder Jacob saw. 
Here, Cooper is alluding to that prayer climbs the ladder Jacob saw, and that is a reference to Jacob's dream where he saw a ladder, and that's found in Genesis 28, 10 to 17. I highly suggest you look it up, Genesis 28. So let me read out just a few verses of Genesis 28. And he, Jacob, dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So there I just read Genesis 28, 12, 13, and 15 to give you a sense of what Cooper is alluding to. So what is he saying here? Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. It makes your days a bit brighter. It brings some sun into your days. And that's through prayer showing us a better glimpse or allowing us to think of times or think of the ways in which God is working. Prayer draws you into that and draws you into a right mindset. And it climbs the ladder Jacob saw. That relates in that if we think about Jacob's dream of that ladder, it was the angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth. And when they ascended, when they climbed up, who was at the top of the ladder? Who did Jacob see at the top of the ladder? Well, it was the Lord, the God of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, the God who made so many wonderful promises, who made so many great declarations of his faithfulness and proved to be true upon them. So how does prayer make the darkened cloud withdraw? How is prayer a great and fantastic blessing? Well, prayer climbs the ladder that Jacob saw and who was at the top of the ladder? the Lord, the faithful one, the one who made so many great and wonderful promises and actually fulfilled them and is fulfilling them. So prayer, the blessing, it draws us to that great God. We meet God in prayer. We are drawn to think about his promises. We're drawn to think about his character. We're drawn to think about his faithfulness. What a great blessing on that front. But let me continue reading the second stanza into the third. So the second half of the second stanza, again, speaking about prayer gives exercise to faith and love, brings every blessing from above. So a great blessing of prayer is that it's an opportunity to exercise our faith and love. Through prayer, we express our trust in God, our faith in God, and by praying to him in praise and praying for others in intercession, we express our love for both God and for our neighbor. What a great and wonderful blessing. Now into the third stanza. Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright, and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. So here, Cooper, in this third stanza, is bringing out a blessing that is built upon and alludes to another passage. And that passage is the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. I highly suggest you look it up. Again, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Let me read out a couple of verses from there. And this is just to give you an idea. In the context of the many forces that oppose us as Christians, in particular the spiritual forces, Satan and his enemies, we are called, therefore, and this is Ephesians 6.13, to put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. So, in the face of Satan, who is opposing us, his demons and cosmic powers seek to thwart us, we are called to stand our ground and put on the full armor of God. Again, read that passage to get an idea of what the armor of God is, what it refers to, and how that could fit into your life. But the important point for this hymn right now is how that passage closes. After a description of the armor of God, Paul the Apostle writes this, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's Ephesians 6, 18. 
So what is a great blessing of prayer here? Well, prayer is another way in which we do battle with Satan. And Satan sees that, recognizes that. That's why he hates when Christians are, pray are praying. That's why he seeks to provide hindrances, as we will discuss in a moment. But prayer is a great blessing in that it is a means of grace, a way in which God strengthens us, a way in which God equips us to do battle with him. And that's why even when the weakest among us, the most immature believer, the youngest believer, whatever it might be the believer with the hardest trials and suffering when that believer he or she when he or she gets on her knees in prayer satan trembles knowing that this person is looking to the great god who is at the top of jacob's ladder that god of faithfulness that god who provides protection who will care for his people and that is a wonderful blessing it is the blessing of being equipped of being empowered and being strengthened and that comes through prayer and cooper makes that abundantly clear in this hymn by referring to this passage so that is the first key feature of the hymn. It outlines, it describes, it expresses the wonderful blessings of prayer. Let me move on to the second key point in saying that Cooper uses scripture to illustrate the importance of prayer in this hymn. What is another feature? In the middle of it, in the fourth stanza, we get this sudden story almost. And that story is, let me, let me first actually read out the fourth stanza. While Moses stood with arms spread wide, success was found on Israel's side. But when through weakness they failed, that moment Amalek prevailed. Here, Cooper is using an illustration that's based on the defeat of the Amalekites. And that comes from Exodus 17, 8 to 16. Again, look it up, Exodus 17, 18 to 16. And the verse that Cooper directly says he is looking to is Exodus 17, 11. I'll read that out. Whenever Moses held up his hands, his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. What Cooper is doing here and what I think is so important and what I think illustrates perfectly the importance of prayer is that he is drawing a parallel between Christians engaged in prayer and Moses lifting up his hands. And Christians neglect the prayer when Moses was weary and he dropped his hands. When Christians are in prayer, they're like Moses with their hands raised up and God will bring them victory. They will prevail. But when Christians neglect prayer, when Christians skip out on prayer, when we totally just abandon our prayer lives, we are like the weary Moses with his hands down and then the Am Amalek, uh, forces of Amalek, they prevail. Our enemies, they prevail. What's important here to note, just for the modern listener perhaps, we have a very specific understanding of success and failure where we might miss out on what is actually going on here. Yes, prayer leads to success, but success shouldn't be defined by what the world says success is. We shouldn't define success when we are free of suffering, free of trials. We shouldn't th think success is only when we get the job we want or only when we do the thing that works out well and we get money or we get respect or whatever it might be. As some of you are probably aware, as most of you are probably aware, the success for Christians is defined on a different metric. True success is when we recognize who we are and recognize who God is as our God. And that includes recognizing that God uses trials, suffering, and even evil for our good. And that makes him good and wonderful. So prayer is like having our hands up and that it brings success, but success should be defined how the Bible defines success. And that isn't how the world defines it. And of course, I'll leave that up to you to think about what success in a biblical standard might be and how that really is rooted in our relationship with God. As we understand through prayer, prayer being an expression of that, how God is working on our behalf and how God is victorious on our behalf. And we should recognize that when we see some prayer, we might receive success in how the world defines it. Maybe we see some prayer, but we do get that job. Or maybe we see some prayer and that girl or boy says yes to us asking them out, whatever it might be. You come up with your own example. But we might be then given over to pride. We might be then given over to lust. When we lower our hands, when we cease to pray, we open ourselves up to attack and our enemy is given chance to prevail over us. But when our hands are stretched out high, when we are committed to prayer, we will experience success as God defines it. And that, of course, is based on looking to what he has provided objectively 
in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Beautiful illustration from Cooper here, getting at the importance of prayer, and one that really draws us into deep meditation, not only upon the text of Scripture, the discipline of prayer, but also how we might define success and failure as those who are God's people. Just wonderful, brilliant, and that's what really stands out of the future as this hymn. Not only a unique illustration, a thoughtful illustration, but one that prompts and promotes further and deeper reflection on our part. Huge. So now let me turn to the third and final future I think it's worth drawing out from this hymn. In this hymn, uh, we see it reflect and confront our approaches to prayer. It reflects and confronts our approach to prayer. How does it do that? Well, to think about how it reflects our approach to prayer so often, I would draw your attention to the first and fifth stanzas. Let me just read those out first. So the first stanza, what various hindrances we meet in coming to a mercy seat. Yet who that knows the worth of prayer, but wishes to be often there? First, it recognizes that there are so many hindrances in coming to prayer. So many hindrances in coming to the mercy seat. I'll talk about the mercy seat in a moment here. But think about your prayer lives. How often do things get in the way of prayer? How often do we allow obstacles to get in the way of prayer? Maybe we'll say we don't have enough time to pray. Maybe we'll say we're too busy to pray or too stressed out to pray. We're not in the right headspace. There are so many hindrances to prayer, and they really are a problem. There's something I think most of us here, unless you're a super saint, <laughs> I guess, would be wrestling with constantly, making the time for prayer, not allowing those hindrances to obstruct us from prayer. But we know that in prayer, we are going to the mercy seat. I'd encourage you to think about the mercy seat. I'll leave an article down below that I suggest you check out on the mercy seat. But in prayer, we are truly heading to a mercy seat in a sense. Again, for those who aren't aware and haven't checked out that article I've linked, uh, Exodus 25, 17 to 22 is where you find out about the mercy seat in the construction of the tabernacle in describing the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testament. That is where we see uh, the mercy seat is this place where God meets his people. And mercy is found there by the blood of a spotless lamb. And I would suggest further study where, especially in our context, we see, especially from passages like Romans 3.25, that Christ is our mercy seat. Christ was the spotless lamb. And through Christ, we meet God. We are justified by faith. And what a wonderful thing that is to think about. And that's where Cooper really brilliantly says we have so many hindrances getting in the way of prayer, prayer being the way we access or get to or take part in the mercy seat that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. And just closing out that stanza, it recognizes that while we often have so many hindrances and obstacles, that we still recognize the worth and value of prayer. We know the worth of prayer. We often wish to be there, but those hindrances still get in the way. And that's really the opening of this hymn. Cooper addresses the realities and difficulties that so often assail us in this discipline or realm of prayer. Turning now to the fifth stanza, he says this, have you no words? I think again. Words flow apace when you complain and fill your fellow creature's ear with the sad tale of all your care. Here, Cooper is reflecting perhaps another experience we have with prayer. Prayer can often be such a challenge. It's crazy to think about spending an hour in prayer, let alone 10 minutes in prayer. Yet, as we wrestle with the time in prayer and think it feels so long, feels so tedious, how quickly can we spend hours upon hours complaining to other people about our problems or lamenting in our own heads about, oh, how much I have to face, how much is going on, what this person said about me, what this person did to me, what this organ organization cheated me out from. We are so quick to complain, but then we find it a struggle to spend 10, 15, an hour uh, amount of time in prayer. And that is something that Cooper is addressing. And this is where this reflection, addressing our struggles with prayer, turns into a wonderful confrontation, a very pastoral corrective when it comes to prayer. Let me read out the final stanza, the way Cooper closes this wonderful hymn. Were half the breath thus vainly spent, to heaven in supplication sent, your cheerful song would oftener be, hear what the Lord has done for me. Cooper closes this hymn by saying, if we took 
just half the time, half the words, half the energy we put into complaining or just reflecting in woe upon our situations and turn that into supplication, how that could radically transform our lives. How, how much more often we would be saying how good the Lord is to me. And that's the encouragement I think this hymn really has, not only for us as we think about this hymn, but us as we think about our prayer lives. When we think about our prayer lives, recognize that it is an opportunity truly to conform our will to God's. It's an opportunity to say as we were taught in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's take our time spent in complaining, our time spent in lamenting on our situations and express that in supplication to God. Take that situation where that person said that bad thing about you and instead turn that to God in prayer and allow that prayer to change perhaps your thoughts and attitudes to that situation. Recognizing that prayer again is a wonderful blessing. It is an opportunity to appreciate who God is, but also who we are in him. And that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think that's really what illustrates the strength of hymns like these from the great evangelicals of the past. They embedded in their hymns not only reflect our experience, not only describe the blessings thoroughly, not only have wonderful scriptural illustrations, they embedded in the hymn confront our attitudes. They call upon the person singing the hymn, reading the hymn, to articulate for themselves how they have fallen short and need to turn to God and trust in him, need to turn to God and express that in prayer. What a wonderful confrontation and one that I will leave for you this time, one that I will take for myself this time. How am I not making the most of the wonderful blessing, the wonderful means of grace that prayer is? What hindrances am I allowing to get in the way of going to the mercy seat? What obstacles am I allowing to get in the way of ascending the ladder that Jacob saw? What are the ways in which I am lowering my hands and opening myself up to attack when I neglect prayer. All great and huge and hard questions, but hopefully as believers think through them, we will better understand the importance of prayer, the blessing of prayer, and just the absolute wonderfulness of prayer as a way we meet our God, as a way we trust in him and express our faith and love. This has been a wonderful time for me describing this hymn, Exhortation to Prayer by William Cooper. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, but that's all I have for you today here on Christian's Colloquy. I hope that if you enjoyed it, though, that you will leave a like, that you will let me know again. Please send me emails, leave uh, comments on my YouTube page, uh, do whatever you want, please. Uh, if you found it as an encouragement, I, I highly, 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 highly suggest and recommend and appreciate if you share this video with people you think might also appreciate it, might also enjoy it, or would just uh, uh, have their own questions or have their own comments that you think I might want to hear and interact with. Anyway, that is truly my conclusion. I hope that you will check me out again, that you will listen again or watch a video again when it comes out soon here on Christian's Colloquy. Take care.